Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual experience to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In this time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? This is, as Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. And this, right now, right here, is where we practice. So whoever you are, whatever has brought you here to this moment, if this is your first time with us, or your 500th, whomever you love, however old you are, whatever brings you to this moment, be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here. Set aside what will come later. Be right here. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Today's chalice lighting comes to us from Kimberly Ann Carlson, a place of belonging and caring. It is not by chance that you arrived here today. You've been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside of you, there is a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, a desire for a place of belonging and caring. Through your struggles, someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief in a shared purpose, a common yet precious resource that belongs to all of us when we share. And so you began seeking a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that holds its arms open to possibilities of love, a heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. Welcome home, welcome to worship.
Our story today is called Philemon and Bosses, and it is brought to us by the Florida Center for Instructional Technology. Long ago, on a high hill in Greece, lived Philemon and Bosses. They were poor, but never unhappy. They had many hives of bees from which they got honey and many vines from which they gathered grapes. One old cow gave them all the milk that they could use and they had a little field in which grain was raised. The old couple had as much as they needed and were always ready to share whatever they had with anyone in want. No stranger was ever turned from their door. At the foot of the hill lay a beautiful village with pleasant roads and rich pasture lands all around but it was full of wicked, selfish people who had no love in their hearts and thought only of themselves. Now, at the time of this story, the people in the village were very busy because Zeus, a god who they believed ruled the world, had sent word that he was about to visit them. They were cooking a great feast and making everything beautiful for his coming. One evening, just at dark, two people came into the valley. They stopped at every house and asked for food and a place to sleep, but the people were too busy or too tired. They were only thinking of the coming of Zeus, the important God. With sore feet and being very tired, the two people came to the hut of Philemon and Bossus. These good people had eaten very little for they were saving their best food for Zeus. When they saw the strangers, Philemon said, surely these men need food more than Zeus. They look almost starved. Indeed they do, said Bossus, and she ran quickly to fix supper for the men. She spread her best white cloth upon the table and fixed bacon, herbs, honey, grapes, bread, and milk. She set these upon the table in all the best dishes she had and called the strangers in. Then what do you think happened? The dishes that the strangers touched turned to gold. The pitcher was never empty, and although they drank glass after glass of milk, the loaf of bread stayed always the same size, although the strangers cut slice after slice. These are very strange travelers, whispered the old couple to each other. They do wonderful things. That night, Philemon and Bossa slept upon the floor so the strangers might have their one bed. In the morning, they went with the travelers to the foot of the hill to see them safely started on their way. Now, good people, said one of the strangers, we thank you and whatever you wish shall be yours. As he said this, his face became that like of the sun. Then Philemon and Bossus knew that Zeus had spoken to them. Oh, great Zeus, we wish that we will always live and pass at the time at the same time as one another, they cried in one voice. Your wish is granted, said Zeus. Yes, and more. Go to your home and be happy. Philemon and Bossus walked home, and lo, their hut was changed into a beautiful castle. The old people turned around to thank their guests, but they had disappeared. In this castle, Philemon and Bossus lived many years. They still did all they could for others and were always so happy that they never thought of wishing anything for themselves. As the years went by, the couple grew very old and sick. And one day Bossus said to Philemon, I wish we might never die, but could always live together. That is my wish too, sighed old Philemon. The next morning, the palace was gone. Bossus and Philemon were gone but there on the hill stood two beautiful trees, an oak and a linden. No one knew what became of the good people. After many years, however, a traveler lying under the trees heard them whispering to each other. Bossus whispered the oak, Philemon whispered the linden. And there the two trees stood through the sun and rain and were always ready to spread their leafy shade over every tired stranger who went that way. And that is the end of our story. We come together this morning at the start of a new congregational year. Over the last several days, we've gathered for worship, learning, 
and just time to be together during our first virtual congregational retreat at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. At the end of a summer unlike many others, we gather online to welcome new members to this community and to reconnect and rededicate ourselves to it. It is always a leap of faith to join a church, always a choice that is hard to explain. There's a joke uh, about academia and professional organizations. The fights are so bitter because the stakes are so low. And on one hand, that's true of churches and other religious institutions. We can sometimes find ourselves consumed by esoteric conflicts that have been going on for so long that nobody quite remembers what the original thing they were fighting was about. That happens. But even when it does, there is a deeper truth. We are here together because the stakes are very high. We're here because faith, the life of faith, does not duck the hard questions but dwells on them. Who are we? What does it mean to be alive? How do I do good in the world? Who or what is evil? Why? What does it mean to seek justice? How do I raise my kids? What does it mean to die? We are here because those questions aren't intellectual exercises. They are compelling for each of us trying to make what meaning we can in the world. And that's one of the reasons why we are here. I, I really believe that. Because, look, I know there are a lot of reasons to join a church. And ministers tend to self-select from folks who already like to think about this stuff. But to just be real for a second, you don't have to be here right now. In 2020, there is no expectation in society that you have to be a member of a church. In fact, in 2020, I can even be reasonably sure that if you opened up a web browser to join us on YouTube on Sunday morning, you aren't just enduring Sinclair's preaching until you can meet friends to go out to brunch. Turns out it's not just ministers who self-select. So for those of us who have gathered in the fall of 2020 on YouTube, let's start there with the acknowledgement that all of us are in some way, maybe that we can't even put into words yet, engaged and compelled by the big questions of life. We come at the start of the, a congregational year because this is a place that knows how important those questions are that knows that the stakes are very high. The German author Goethe writes, the world is so empty if one thinks only of mountains and rivers and cities, but to know someone who thinks and feels with us and who, though distant, is close to us in spirit, this makes the earth for us an inhabited garden. Each week, we share our joys and sorrows in loving community. We ride together over hills and through valleys, a caravan in search of peace. As our next hymn plays, feel free to type your name or the name of someone that you're holding in your heart in the chat box next to this video. Whether you do so in joy or in sorrow, know that you are not alone.
This is not, we should say out loud, how we usually gather at the start of a congregational year. We have not gathered together physically for worship since March 15th. In March, we closed the building in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in order to help flatten the curve and buy time, we thought, for our medical system. Since then, we've learned a lot about pandemics and learned about how this particular virus likes to spread. And a group of 200 folks with a median age above 60 gathering in a single room and singing together for an hour is um, well, not ideal right now. So we are forced to adapt. And while six months ago I would never have thought this possible, it's likely we'll be online for a fair amount of this congregational year too. COVID-19 cases are simply not contained in Lincoln, Nebraska, and our first and clearest moral duty as a church is to preserve life. If that means we get comfortable with online worship for a while longer, well, that's what we're going to do. We gather because we know the stakes are very high. If we start there, then we should say also that in the last six months, the stakes have become unavoid unavoidably terrifyingly high. 20 years ago, it was possible to live life unaware of the danger posed by climate change. 12 years ago, in 2008, it was possible to believe, as a white person in America, that we had somehow arrived at a post-racial society. Possible, but wrong. Five years ago, I could claim that I was sure that, whatever the result, every candidate for public office in this country would abide by the final result of an election. And six months ago, it was plausible to think that all that stuff about connection and interdependence that the Unitarians talk so much about was just a pleasant metaphor, as if my life does not depend on the very air you breathe and the choices you make. Reverend Wayne Arneson writes this, take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. This is the second great truth of religious community. We gather because the stakes are very high, and we gather because we know that when we do, we are not alone. Unitarian Universalism is a covenantal faith. The essence of our shared experience as Unitarian Universalists is not belief, but relationship. Somehow, when we gather, in person or online, there is more than the sum of our individual parts. In the, the alchemy of the moment, two plus two equals five, and while the stakes are still very high, the path is a little clearer. 
to be covenantal in this moment, I think, is to recognize our interconnectedness. That's the first step. But covenant is more than simply a recognition of what is. Covenant is a commitment to what can be. None of this is possible if we do it alone. Stacy and I have a two-year-old daughter in, in the midst of a pandemic. Understand, none of this is possible if we do it alone. And so covenant is a choice to hold each other's welfare as central and important. When we enter into covenant, whether it's through marriage or joining a church or forming a pod to weather a pandemic, we are committing ourselves to some sense of a common good that is beyond simply that which is best for me. This is going to be a very strange fall. I, I don't know what the next few months will hold. I check the Lancaster County COVID-19 dashboard every day when they update it at four o'clock. I wake up and read the Washington Post first thing every morning to see if there's some new tragedy or event in the life of our country that the church needs to respond to. Odds are in the next few months, we're going to have some hard, hard moments. But take courage, friends. You are not alone. This reading is called I Want to Be with People by Dana Worsnap. Often people say that they love coming to a place with so many like-minded people. I know just what they're getting at, and I know that they aren't getting it quite right. I don't want to be with a bunch of people who think just like me. I want to be in a beloved community where I don't have to think like everyone else to be loved, to be eligible for salvation. I want to be with people who value compassion, justice, love and truth, though they have different thoughts and opinions about all sorts of things. I want to be with independent-minded people of good heart. I want to be with people who have many names and no name at all for God. I want to be with people who see me in my goodness and dignity, who also see my failings and foibles, and who still love me. I want to be with people who feel their interconnection with all existence and let it guide their footfalls upon the earth. I want to be with people who see life as a paradox and don't always rush to resolve it. I want to be with people who are willing to walk the tightrope that is life and who will hold my hand as I walk mine. I want to be with people who let church call them into a different way of being in the world. I want to be with people who support, encourage, and even challenge each other to higher and more ethical living. I want to be with people who inspire one another to follow the call of the Spirit. I want to be with people who covenant to be honest, engaged, and kind, who strive to keep their promises and hold me to the promises I make. I want to be with people who give of themselves, who share their hearts and minds and gifts. I want to be with people who know that human community is often warm and generous, sometimes challenging, and almost always a grand adventure. In short, I want to be with people like you. It is always a leap of faith to join a church, always. Anyone who claims otherwise is selling you something and it's probably not a great church. When we join a church, we don't really know what we're doing. We can't know really what we're getting into. We don't know the fights that go back 30 years that nobody can remember the start of. And we don't know the friendships and support that we're going to get from unexpected places. Each time we welcome new members to this congregation, I'm struck anew by the trust 
we are given, all of us, to welcome each other with grace. How much more now? Three and a half years ago, when I was in search, I was often asked to make the case for why congregations are important. I am a millennial, and this is the question for millennials in a world of of, uh, world-class TED Talks on the internet and a generation of transient young folks and a different understanding of the expectation of church. How can we say that churches aren't unnecessary throwbacks? And what I would have said back then, and I, I would have been right about, is something like this. Churches are important because they're a place where we come together in person, in community, and experience shared space and shared time. Despite our technological connections, our interconnectedness is clearest when we are together. I've had to come up with a new answer this summer. Because indeed, the fact of these dozen or so people joining our community this morning, today, in the midst of a pandemic when we cannot be physically together is proof that the mere fact of physical presence with each other was never, never the most important part of the church. This is old, old theology, but it is vital now. The church is not the building. The church is the community. And this community not only is enduring, but it is growing in this moment. So as we start this new year together, there's a post-it stuck to my monitor at home. Every day, I look at it as I'm doing the daily update. Take courage, friends, it says. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. We welcome new members into our congregation in a few different ways. Yesterday, Kelly Ross and I spent the morning with our newest members who are joining the church today, learning about each other and answering questions about the congregation. This afternoon, those joining the congregation will visit the church one at a time to sign the membership book. And yesterday, as part of that new membership class, we recorded the liturgy that welcomes new members into the congregation. One of our newest members spoke on behalf of the gathered, and since it is best practice for staff not to speak as members of the congregation they serve, and indeed, um, because I am still a member at First Unitarian Church of Baltimore, a member welcomed the, the newest members on behalf of the gathered congregation. What follows is a recording of the liturgy as we recorded it yesterday. You have come before us to join yourselves to this church. What is it you wish to receive? We come from differing backgrounds. We have walked other pathways. We come to be assured that we are among supportive friends, that our voices will be heard in reading and singing and in discussions and decisions. We come to share our talents and our gifts. We are here to join in community with all of you. Have we, members and friends of this congregation, prepared a place in this home and in our hearts to receive these people into community with us? We have a place for them and we receive them warmly. This is a place of friendship and freedom. We guard their dignity and worth as we do our own. In our search for truth, we honor their right of free expression This church is a cradle for our dreams and our workshop for our common endeavors. We gladly share it with them. I now charge you as new members of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln to share with us your creative thoughts, your vital experiences, your questions, your doubts, your discoveries, and the principles which matter most to you. Are these people gathered before us welcomed into our community? They are with great rejoicing. Welcome, everybody.
each Sunday we take up a collection to support the work of our church. This week, if you would like to give a small offering, you may send a check with offering in the memo line to 6300 A Street, 68510. You may also log in if you have a profile in our Realm database and give with the push of a button. I think the easiest way is to give through text giving. In order to do so, please text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. That's UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. This information is in chat and also in a slide on your screen. Friends, the stakes are very, very high. But this church is cradle for our dreams and workshop for our common endeavors. Let us begin the year, this year, in the history of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln together, united in community even as we are apart. Blessed be and amen. <laughs> 